one minute. Recording has started, so please. Uh, Everyone mute yourselves. Be, mute yourself. Only Moini and uh, uh, CP will be uh, online. And initially. Uh, initially, um, and then we'll ask one and by one to, uh, to talk and to take it forward. Okay. And if, um, Abid, I'll be very soon asking Saz to join and we will want to see her also. Okay. So, okay. So here goes, we begin. So welcome everybody to another session of the book club. Um, now, you know that we have had terrific good luck in attracting lots of good speakers um, and lots of authors willing to talk about their own books. So I feel we are on such a roll, you know, I just don't want it to end. We are booked until February, believe it or not, with a speaker every week. So it's absolutely fantabulous. But what does happen then is that when a speaker commits to a date, which is rather uh, quite a bit in the future, sometimes when you approach that date, it does it ceases to be convenient for that person. So this is what has happened uh, this time. And uh, we were, uh, well, because of that, we were able to rope in uh, CP Surendran, you know, in this slot, which suddenly um, was available. And uh, Satish and CP had been talking and we knew about this book and uh, Satish said, okay, let's schedule uh, CP. He's willing to talk about his own book. And I thought, oh my God, how sad that I have to give him a February slot, you know, so much later. And the, the excitement of a new book sort of wears thin, you know, then that much time goes by. So maybe the gods were, you know, looking down upon us and they decided that we should see CP's book sooner rather than later. So here we are. And very, very fortunately, he was free this Sunday to join us. Um, so I, um, I'm i just gonna say one thing that we got to know CP when he was editor of the Times of India in Pune several years ago. And I read the novel that he had then recently written, The Iron Harvest and enjoyed it. Uh, and I thought, aha, he's a good writer. Now, now that I have begun to read this novel that is under review today, I was just telling CP that in these years, he has clearly grown as a writer because that book was good, but this one I think is very good. And it's interesting in so many ways. You know, it's so layered, everything is complex, nothing is straightforward. Uh, the way the story is presented, the characters that he has chosen, um, the themes, you know, which comment upon so much that you can see in the world around you. And um, I mean, it, it's, it's fascinating. I haven't finished reading the book, but I can see that it is a book well worth reading. Now, we lost touch with CP, you know, when he left Pune. Uh, but Saz has been in touch with him through the years. And I think she is probably better equipped to introduce him to the group today. So Saz, um, this is Saz Agarwal, who is a writer also. And we have had her on the book club platform talking about her books in the past more than once. So Saz, can I invite you to first of all, introduce CP to everybody. Thank you so much, uh, Moini. So uh, actually, I was really happy when I saw that CP was listed for the book club and I planned to attend. And just a short while ago, Moini called me and asked me uh, whether I'd introduce him. And then I thought to myself, shall I call CP and ask him for his CV, which I could read out? Uh, or should I just Google and see what I get? Or shall I just tell you a few incidents that I remember, you know, I, was, I started thinking about um, how how well I know CP. And then I thought it'll just be more interesting uh, if I tell you some of the things that I know about him. And let me go back about a uh, long time ago, about 15 years ago. I'm not sure exactly when, but it would have been around 2005 or six. And at that time I was doing a, a semester teaching at the SEM HRD. It was some kind of personal growth trainings and one day at one of these sessions, there was this young boy, I don't remember the details, but he said that um, he had written a letter to the uh, editor of the Times of India about something he'd read in the paper and uh, some kind of query or complaint. And he'd received a 
very comprehensive reply. And that really surprised me because in those days, in the uh, late 1990s and even in the early 2000s, being a newspaper editor in this country was really a very big deal. And editors were very highly respected. They had a lot of power. Quite often, they were also very impressed with themselves. And they were really busy people too. So it was kind of outside my scheme of things to have an editor replying. And I asked him, who was it? Was it uh, you know, the resident, was the editor in Delhi? Or was it the resident editor in Yorktown? And he said, no, the editor in Pune. And then I, it began to make sense to me because I knew CP was the resident editor in Pune at the time. And I knew that he's the kind of person who would do something like this, being a thorough professional and not just being impressed with himself and you know, being full of um, you know, how he was changing the world by sharing news. He was somebody who did his job. He valued his readers and that kind of raised uh, uh, CP in my estimation. I've actually known him since um, um, the late uh, early 90s or maybe even the late 80s when we were both working in the Times of India. And at that time, he was, of course, well known for his brilliant writing. Okay, He was known for the quality of his work, but he was also known for being somebody who was a totally no-nonsense person. He would say anything to anyone. And, you know, that was fine. And he wasn't going to take anything. So, I, I mean, you know, slightly unpredictable, not very popular. And here's somebody who's also a poet. Now, coming down over the years, CP has had three volumes of poetry published by Penguin. Is that correct, CP? Am I, yeah, did I get the number? Yeah. yeah. Actually, it's four, but I'm, totally, yeah. Uh, sorry, please, uh, four volumes? It's four volumes, two from Penguin and uh, one from Speaking Tiger, one from Harper Collins. Thank you. So I'm a fan. I have some books. I don't have them all. But like Moini said, I've also read, um, you know, Ann House, which I loved, and Hardell, which I loved. Uh, so what were the other novels you've done, CP, if you don't mind uh, my asking? Well, you? Uh, there was another one called... Uh, 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 lost and found and and then you have uh, this one so it's the fourth novel right this is the fourth novel. so uh, i mean i feel cp is really brilliant writer which moini already said um his uh, work his novels are literary masterpieces so strong plots quality of language and of course as i said he's worked as an editor for various newspapers cp you were with uh, dna yeah, DNA, Times of India, Open Magazine. So uh, a senior journalist who has managed to, you know, meet his deadlines and also at the same time bring out this huge body of um, creative work. The other thing which I want to tell you is that CP is a thorough family man. He's completely devoted to his children and his beautiful wife. And he was devoted to his parents, has a very strong relationship with his sister. And these are things that I really, really admire about him. Um, so he's a poet, he's a cynic, he's a thorough professional, he's a family man. And uh, now Moini, over to you. Thank you, thank you, Saz. So you know what you said about uh, this boy who said that CP replied to him? Well, I've had that experience. CP had written an article in the Times of India, which I thoroughly disagreed with. <laughs> and uh, I wrote, you know, I, I, we didn't know him. So I just wrote to the editor saying, you know, this is why I disagree. And I, I, I mean, he was so generous, you know, in his response, he was so open. And, and I love that because, you know, people tend to lack that open-mindedness. He was willing to hear the criticism and he actually uh, printed a part of my letter in the paper, you know, the, the main paragraph where I disagreed and gave my reasons for disagreement. He had the generosity of heart and mind to publish it for the whole world to see. And uh, that, that was marvelous. I, I totally um, admired that openness of mind. Now, as I said, that uh, at that point, um, I read the Iron Harvest and uh, liked it very much. And I was quite thrilled that I've actually met 
the writer of this book that I liked. And uh, so I want to say at this point, I have started reading um, uh, The One Love and Many Lives of Osip B. Now the title itself is so intriguing. You know, you wonder, oh, what can this be about? And what's Osip, for God's sake, you know, not a name that one quickly connects with or recognizes. Um, it, it promises to be a very, very good read. And I just gave CP the compliment of telling him that I hope it, it features in the Booker list and makes it. So that's how highly I think of it. And uh, I'm totally looking forward to reading the whole novel. Now, CP, the thing is that because we have, you know, shanghai you and brought you in, um, at, on this uh, slot, but the thing is that we have been a little unfair to our members that we haven't given them the time that we usually give them to acquire and read the book and be a little more informed. So, um, but the way our book club functions is that the presenter always tells us about the book because we don't demand that our members read and then only come. We, we are open to the idea of their wanting to know about a book. So can I ask you to tell us about your book? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Satish. Thank you, Mohini. And thank you very much, Saas. And Saas is a, a soulmate of mine. She doesn't know that. Um, now know, she does. Uh, yeah, and there are several reasons for that, but maybe this is not the time to talk about that. Now, uh, I realize that this book, uh, is uh, not a very small book. It is around 372 pages. And uh, uh, it has taken some seven years for me to write it. And the guy who wrote the first line of the first version of this book is not the guy who wrote the last line of this book in the last version of it, you know? Uh, and I don't think, uh, I have, of course, I have several experiences in my life which have been uh, rather, uh, chemicalizing, I must say, uh, which, which has changed me. And I think the last seven years, uh, one way or the other, also has changed me a lot. Uh, now, when I say uh, I took seven years to write this book, one of the things we must realize about writing is that, uh, as Doris Lessing, for example, said, you know, when you sit down, you know, before you put your first word onto the paper or on the screen, uh, the novel is a universe. I mean, you can do anything with it. You know, it is a, you know, the, you know, it is huge, right? It is infinite. But the moment you put the first word on the page, it shrinks into a room. You know, you have four walls. You may have a window. You may have a door. But basically, it is the room. You know, you have to put everything around, and in in proper places in that room. Uh, so this book, when it started, One Love and the Many Lives of Ossip B, when it started, was a, a different animal altogether. Uh, you know, and I didn't think, uh, I, at that moment when I started writing, I began writing this novel in Kasauli on a rented cottage. And I think I must have put about 10,000 words in, in the first four or five days. And I thought they're lovely, great words. Actually, they were not bad words. But in this version of the novel, uh, in the, from the first 10,000 words or so, the only word which has actually survived is Kastauli. There's nothing else from that uh, you know, uh, great amount of labor. And one of the things about is also that, you know, because uh, I was going through in my own ways, several kind of uh, you know, uh, traumatic and crisis, uh, uh, traumatic experiences, somehow it is in the last seven, months or six or seven months of my seven years of writing that it actually fell together. Um, Saza has actually read uh, maybe the fifth or sixth, maybe the fourth or fifth draft of it. And she liked it, uh, but I knew it was not enough, you know, to make people like a book, you know, you have, to, and I'm not saying they have done it here, uh, but one has to go over and above that. One has to actually make them rethink about things, you know, even the most common objects, for example, a table or a, the way you hold up a, a phone, you know, to make people aware of the way the light falls on it and, you know, make them take a second look. 
Uh, there's an attempt which I have done. I don't, I don't know if I have succeeded, but I can tell you one thing very clearly. In the first six and a half years of this writing, it wouldn't have happened at all. If it has happened to some extent, is in the last seven months. Now, what is this novel about? This novel is about an 18 year old boy, Osip Balakrishnan, falling in love with his teacher, Elizabeth Hill, uh, who disappears, right? And in his search for her or across continents, he realizes that uh, Stalin is not quite dead, nor actually is Osip Mandelstam. And then he re begins to realize or un he starts unraveling the secrets of his adoptive family's history, which made him assume this name, which is Osip Balakrishnan. Now, who is Osip? Osip, as you, you know, this is for the uh, you know, general public, but I keep saying that as a kind of an intro into the novel. Uh, Osip, so Osip Mandelstam, you know, Osip Mandelstam was one of the greatest poets of uh, uh, modern Russia. Uh, beginning, uh, I mean, all of his, almost all his outputs came between 1920 and 1934. And Stalin uh, actually exiled him because he wrote a very harsh poem on Stalin himself, which he was foolish enough, like all writers and poets are, at least a few of them, but this is certainly like me, he read it out. And someone, uh, you know, spread the word. And of course, you can't have a secret in the Stalinist society exactly as we can't have a secret in the present Indian society, because you will be called out or shamed or, you know, it is, you are in a surveillance uh, mode all the time. So what happens to Osip Mandelstam is that in 1934, he's exiled to uh, Siberia and his wife, Nadia, a very pretty and very intelligent woman and very faithful woman you know, to his poetry, uh, accompanies him. And then uh, due to a lot of efforts, you know, including people like Bukharin, whom of course later Stalin shoots, uh, executes. Uh, he comes back briefly, uh, but early 1938, I think February or Jan, I can't remember, he's exiled again. And this time he starves himself to death, right? It is not as if, uh, you know, this all happens to human beings, right? You know, we can't say, oh, he did that, therefore, you, know, you can't say that because although uh, Osip uh, Mandelstam wrote a very harsh poem against Stalin, in his exiled days, he wrote one or two poems in favor of Stalin. They were the cringeworthy poems. Some of uh, that poem, one of uh, at least four or five lines of that poem, uh, are quoted in this book, somewhere in, towards the second part of the book. So then Nadia writes two volumes of memoirs about him in the 70s, you know, and uh, in London Book of Reviews, uh, Letter Review of Books, uh, Seamus Haney, the great uh, writer, poet, actually has a review of those volumes. And uh, Seamus says very clearly that this is one of the best uh, books he has read, uh, you know. And, there, uh, you know, we come across a whole host of characters and we realize that the writing or the rebelling of a writer is not uh, a straightforward line. It is so layered, right? And very often you'll also see that Nidia talking about uh, Mandelstam as almost, you know, he, she loves him, she admires him, but he, she memorizes every single poem of his because of the Gestapo and, you know, the burning and confiscation, con, you know, all those things. Uh, he says, he's tyrannically possessive about me. So now we actually have a victim and the victor rolled into one which is the voice we are talking about here, right? We are talking about each one of us, although we, see, we all think that we are very good people in relation to the world outside. That's because of the structure of perception. We can't really step out of ourselves and look at us, which is the reason why the idea of gossip comes in. You know, the gossip is a whole thing of processing information from various immoral channels, right? So what happens when you do that is that you see that when the world looks at you and the way you look at yourself are very different, you know, they clash almost. 
So people who shout and really a good people who actually talk about, you know, liberalism, moral values, ethical values, maybe actually they're right. But simultaneously, there are people talking about them too, about their, you know, the way they treat themselves and their husbands and their lovers and their cooks. It goes on and on and on, right? right? So here we are talking about a complexity of narrative, which Osip Balakrishnan, who is so named because his adoptive great-grandfather, who is in the 90s, Mr. Menon, he's a Stalinist himself. He has killed people, some 23 people, but now he pretends that he has Alzheimer's or he pretends he has Alzheimer's according to his very bitter but supportive wife, Gloria Innale. Gloria Innale is a very symbolic name. Innale in Malayalam means yesterday, right? So, and Gloria, despite her, uh, you know, uh, uh, misgivings, actually writes a, a book about uh, Mr. Menon, praising him. But that is not the truth. But that is what the book is all about, right? So in this book, you have two or three voices from history coming in. So you have Stalin on one level, it's a voice. There's a voice which shared by, shared by both Mr. Menon, the great grandfather of this boy, and Osip Balakrishnan himself. There is another voice, which is the persecuted voice. That is a poet's voice. We are talking about free speech here. We are talking about uh, your inclination or the human inclination. I ask you if you have read James Joyce in your, uh, you know, Stephen de Dallas or in Ulysses, you will see that the idea of man to learn is to fall once and then come up again, right? So it is the idea of experience. Now, if you have a prescriptive society, whether it is Stalinist or whether it is uh, right wing or whether it is left wing or whatever it is, we still have a prescription for your uh, conduct. Now, there is where this novel aims to differ, not in terms of saying that is wrong or this is right, but to lay it out there so that you get to see that things are a bit more complex than what we may be putting out on social media or on newspapers or even in one's own head, right? So uh, the hallucinatory voices is not as if it is constantly there is a hallucination, that is not the case how this boy grows out of those hallucinations, how he gets to, gets to know his own voice towards the very end, and what, invo what is involved in actually getting to understand and speak that voice. What does it take? It takes a whole bunch of, uh, well, to, for want of a better word, a picaresque kind of gamut of experiences which he goes through. So this book is about this boy, boy growing up to become something in terms of a voice and authenticity, not in terms of a career. But he does take up uh, quite a few interns, jobs of an intern through his love affair and all those things. So the entire power equations, the idea of subnationality and nationality, patriotism, liberalism, um, uh, you know, right-wing uh, problems and, you know, uh, themes. All these are part of his life. It is not, they're, they're not preached, or at least the attempt is not to preach it. And as far as I know, I have not done that at all. Uh, although people will read differently into it. These uh, themes which we are living with now, right now. So this is a novel, it's a kind of, it is a dialogue with our times through seven or eight characters. And although it's set now, within one paragraph or two lines, you will actually see uh, a, a timescape covered, say, of 100 years from 1930, say, to 2018. So we cover that very often. Uh, we cover that kind of time and space terrain within the, within the telescope of a, uh, uh, the telescoped uh, ambit of a sentence. So, uh, it is complex, you are right about that. Or I mean, uh, I wish it could have been a much um, simpler one. In fact, the, a simpler one would have been a much more linear kind of uh, novel. This is not a linear novel in that sense. 
So this novel is about us. This novel is about the contemporary fraught kind of society we live in. And let me just go back one more time before I give the mic back to you. So when I say about uh, a Stalin as a metaphor or Osip Mandelstam as another metaphor, we are also talking about uh, the kind of transformation or transmogrifications that you know, our society uh, is going through. Uh, you know, the idea of a surveillance society where we give money to be uh, surveilled. You know, we, we put cameras right outside our house. We put camera on the cam, you know, a television or a, on, a, on a computer so we can watch it from somewhere else, what's going on at house, you know, the social media where everybody's on tab, the idea of fact-checking, which is very good, but the fact-checking itself needs fact-checking, you see. Um, so we are talking about a society where what Stalin once dreamed that a son betrays his father for the cause of the state, which is Stalin himself, or a sister betrays brother or lover betrays lover, that betrayal, that sense of thing, you know, to be the need, which Chimamanda, for example, said in a, in a note recently in a blog, you know, this, this urge to out angel each other, you'll see. That is, I think, uh, uh, it, it's a, it, is a, it, is a, it is a dangerous, uh, at one level, you know, a dangerous kind of area we are moving into. And I think it goes against the idea of uh, writing an art because it's actually you're talking about a prescribed way of life, which means that you are not able to get into uh, the heart of experience. Over to you. Okay, all right. Oh, have I completely depressed everybody? <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, 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 okay. <laughs> no, that, that, that was, uh, yeah, I, I think everyone would have sort of got some idea about what the book is out to do. Um, it's very disturbing, you know. Ah, there we to, go. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is. It is very disturbing. And of course, one is disturbed and then this book kind of underlines all the so reasons. I must, uh, I must interrupt you for a moment here. Did, you said disturb, right? Do I dare to disturb the universe? You remember the line from T.S. Eliot? No. Yes, yes. Oh, so yeah, I think, um, I think that this is what a good writer does actually. Um, and yes, I, I found it disturbing. And in fact, I was wondering to what extent I was going to be further disturbed as I continue to read the novel. But there are so many things that um, already I have read, you know, in the first 80 pages odd, which resonate, like you, we know what you're talking about. We, we are experiencing it. And this is not the only place on the planet that is going through this either. So which is not a very pretty picture. So there is that. Now, um, coming down to something very concrete, uh, can I ask you about the narrative technique? Um, Osip has first-person narration? Well, actually, uh, it is like this, you know, Osip is um, a first-person narrative, but as soon as Osip stops, you know, um, can you guys hear me clearly? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, so Osip is one part of it, you know, you really can't identify him with the author, you know, or the narrator, right? Because although he is a first person narrative, the moment he stops talking, a third person narrative takes place, you know, it comes in, right? Yes. So there is a mix of narratives, uh, uh, which happens, I think, uh, in our lives as well, you know, in, in very many ways. So there are very often what, you know, I'm not actually sticking to this point, but very often in our head, in the voices that we have or we listen to, uh, we actually refer ourselves as he or you you know, in second and third person, right? So we have a, a certain kind of a, a shifting narratives here. So what Osip Balakrishnan thinks of himself, himself is not what, for example, Elizabeth thinks of himself. Now what, uh, and there are secrets between them, which neither of them never get to know. For example, uh, Elizabeth makes Osip believe that he is responsible for her pregnancy. And that he, she went to a, a abortion clinic to
to save him and of course herself from the entire subsequent uh, you know uh, troubles right but till the end osip never gets to know for example that the abortion never took place but she was never pregnant but so there are there are secrets Characters here only the reader gets to know, you know, and uh, which is the reason why you know the play is uh, you know you know uh, it's almost like a play in at least like a movie, for example, where you get to know more than the characters themselves. So the narratives are mixed between you know first and third person. Right. So a lot of dramatic irony there. Um, now uh, uh, your protagonist. is i mean you can call him dysfunctional you can call him troubled but he's not the usual normal right so uh, this concept of having an unstable narrator is is very uh, very much part of modernism isn't it uh, you know uh, you're absolutely right you know he is unstable because he actually suffers from a dysfunction he suffers from a disorder which is shared between him and his grandfather Uh, i don't know how to pronounce it uh, you know it's a french term called uh, folie a famille is it means folie a famille it means that the family a genetic disorder uh, shared by uh, uh, sorry a, 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 a disorder a mental disorder shared by a family members not necessarily genetically pulled together right so the interesting thing and it's a very common occurrence as i research into it i am told but the interesting thing about that kind and what happens there is that the the dominant guy the dominant player or man or woman actually kind of transmits his or her disorder his or her mental world into the subordinate's uh, you know head mind so he or she begins to start living those worlds all right so if the great grandfather is talking about a stalinist time and persecutions and you know murders and politics and you know and poetry and all that you grow up in that world is are sharing those values and those icons the thing is it is not really a clinical disorder from what i can read into it because although it is uh, medically speaking we are all living it the idea of a hashtag the idea of virality the idea of social influences the idea of you know uh, uh you know political leaders as i you know icons to emulate what do you mean by these things you just mean that you are part of their world that you follow them you you know you share their uh, tweets you share their uh, statements their values you know you know so there is a genetic disorder there is a there is a mental disorder that we are going through in this world and it is a perhaps uh, uh, the technology has empowered a behavioral mutation or facilitated a mutation for us but what we are also talking about that there is a history of this there is a history of dominant ideas and dominant values and we think this is what it is and it is never is the case it keeps moving it is something else tomorrow is another viral thing tomorrow is another value you know at one time uh, oscar wilde was put in prison what was it 1983 or 1999 uh, you know for homosexuality now if you do that if you if you if you castigate a homosexual you could be in prison so look at the you know look at the look at the look at how it has moved you know in 100 Things years or changed. so absolutely one step end of the spectrum you come to the other end of the spectrum right you know you, you thought that you know office was 10 to 5 office is 10 to any time any any moment any day sitting in your home now so everything is changing right the ethics is changing the values are changing and mm-hmm. the passion with which we say this is correct you know we must kill cows and i am against killing cows although i do eat beef once in about 10 years because it inflicts pain on big animals you know but that could be seen both as a liberal point of view for example that you can eat your beef and you know you can't eat into the menu part of one's private life you can also say you're inflicting pain you know so, you know there's a third party saying that it is a a religious thing i mean the point is that there's so many sides to it you know everything 
so when we are talking about uh, you know uh, a book like this uh, all i can really urge you or uh, urge the reader is to approach it with uh, a, a one assumption and that assumption is that do not look for uh, a kind of reinforcement uh, for your values or of your convictions from this book if you do that you will be reading yourself completely into it which is not exactly the thing to do perhaps right okay so i'm going to ask you one more question and then you know open it out to everybody um and that question is about your protagonist who's a school boy but uh, from you know the small part that i have read he behaves like a grown person doesn't he i mean uh he goes off and uh, he 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 drinks like a grown person uh any comment on that the nature of this school boy protagonist who somehow yeah. behaves in a very grown up way so so uh, to go back to your earlier question about you know is connected you're talking about the unstable uh, narrator right so you know unstable is one part of it unreliable narrator is an accepted practice i, I think probably starting in a very concrete form with you know ford madox ford's uh, you know the good soldier is a great book you must read it madox ford him the narrator is completely unreliable you don't know what the hell he is talking from paragraph to paragraph you have no idea and it so turns out that ford madox ford himself was a very unreliable person you know or the great writer this is unstable so we, we what we are talking about is a this uh, uh, a, a kind of a dysfunctional voice in a deranged world how does that pan out that's one part of uh, you know the answer the second part of the answer is that uh, you will see in this book for example okay let us take with the french president macron at the age of 59 15 he falls in love with his class teacher who's 39 years old <laughs> you guys have no problem with that you have no problem when children in sudan and maybe even kashmir take to guns and shoot people and talk about it you have no problems with that you have no problems when the entire idea of christian or even i don't know other religious uh, histories as well the child soldiers in crusades you have no problems you have no problems actually children dro dropping out of schools and colleges and building empires worth of billions of dollars but you do have a problem when in the indian setting a boy of 18 going on to 19 falling in love with his teacher gets drunk and all i can say is that the macron image is actually a part of the passage between him and his friend anand who is a fake who grows up to a fake guru these people age fast you know in this time in this google times you have either babies and then you have old men like us you know not you me <laughs> all right so the thing is there are no children the exposure level 13 plus nudity uh, violence of language uh, violence of deeds is part of your uh, you know certification of your yes. otts Yes. so i do not i do not subscribe to the view because also i must tell you that in this book age is a very fluid kind of matrix you have people from 80 to 96 coming together the elizabeth uh, who is 30 years or 31 uh, her other lover in london is actually uh, 72 or 73 right and it is apparently a platonic relationship you have arjun bedi who is going through a kind of a, a, a social uh, uh, castration and you know sequestration because he is violating the existing norms of contact right he is uh, some 60 plus uh, you have you have a whole bunch of people six or seven people representing various ages age but they all come to the same book you know um, i think Okay okay so folks open forum you are yeah. willing to box cp with questions can i make a comment yes please, please. latika yes latika yeah um this is rendra i'm latika Hi. uh it's a pity i haven't read your novel i've heard please you read speak it. about please buy it please read it 
<laughs> I will. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Now that you've spoken about your novel, I will buy it and yes. I will read it. And, uh, and, promote, me, and promote me furiously. <laughs> A couple of By the way, this is uh, this is Latika Padgaukar. Okay. Oh, journalist in her own right. Yes. Now, Mrs. Rainer, a couple of things struck me while you were speaking, and I started reading the novel. I don't write read, reading online, and uh, in any case, my internet is not working, so I couldn't read it on my mobile. So I'll read it hopefully in the next week. But what struck me was the word Osip, the name Osip. Now. Mm. The minute I heard this, I know I have read Mandelstam. Oh, yeah. Uh, I read some of those great uh, writers and poets of Russia, Mayakovsky and Anna Akhmatova and so on. Hope Against Hope. That was a yes. very difficult time. Absolutely. Very difficult time. Now, you used a couple of words, and I wondered how right they were for this era and whether they have the same meaning for Osip Mandelstam's era. Yeah. You used the word dialogue with her times. Hmm. And you also use the word fraught just now mm. when you were speaking. Yeah. So I can understand the times are fraught in, in, were fraught in Russia, then they're still fought, fraught in Russia now. Mm. And they're fraught here also, and they're fraught in many different countries. But I want to know whether the word Osip as used by Osip's father for his grandchild really uh, resonates with the Osip that I have in mind, Osip the poet who died in, you know, when he was not very old in any case. And that was a very different time in Russia under Stalin. That's number one. And uh, I saw that his poetry was extreme, at one time fluid, and at the another time, very, very intense. Akhmatova, all's poetry is also intense. Her writing is very intense. So I'm hoping to see something like that in the book. I'm not asking you any questions since I haven't read the book. But I'm oh. hoping that I see sure. something like this when I read your book. But I don't know how the two fraught times of those years in Russia and these years in India, whether there's any comparison. Yeah, they're all very valid points, I must say. And thank you for asking this question. Um, uh, that's precisely the theme of the, one of the themes of the book. It is to draw parallels from history and say where we are going in terms of uh, a certain kind of uh, uh, reputation which is not exactly fast, but it's more like, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, well, as I say, fraught, because we really don't know where we are moving in this, because this is very fluid, you know, everything is so, like, you know, uh, what do I say? It's like a quicksand, you know, it keeps moving up and down, and you don't know how to stop it, and you don't know how to navigate through it. Uh, Osip Mandelstam, you know, write about Anna Makhatova, Marie Svisteva, you know, uh, Gunilev, all those poets, the great poets. Uh, Osip's thing was that he actually had, as I said earlier, uh, he was uh, quite, uh, what do you call it, uh, divided uh, in his own way, because once he found the goings very tough and he knew he was going to die, Despite his creativity and genius and the ebullience, natural ebullience, he used to compose songs, right? He never used to write. And then uh, Nadia would write, write it down. Uh, but the thing is that he actually tried to please Stalin in very many ways. All of us do. You see, that's the whole point. You, you understand this. You know, this yeah. is not a question actually of, you know, being, you know, externalizing uh, one's, uh, you know, goodness or evil onto others. We are it, you know, we cannot get away from this. That is the whole point. If things go tough with us, and unless you are a Mahatma Gandhi or somebody, you are bound to bend down, you know, that is what it is, you know. And what was Stalin saying all those days? He was saying that, you know, I have to bend history to my will. Why? For a more beautiful, tomorrow for your children, so die now. And so he kills six million of them, you know, every night he will sit down with a blue and red pencil and do that, right? Um, kill the, the dearest and nearest people in his own family, in fact. What I'm trying to say is that the idea of a delayed gratification as an ideological cause to sacrifice 
so that tomorrow would be a better one for you, your people, all these nice things could be taken to one extreme level, which is happening to a great extent, not only just in terms of the right wing, I'm talking the left wing as well. You know, I'm, see, I'm, 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 I'm not going to, uh, you know, accuse people of things. I'm going to be part of it, right? So therefore, the parallels which we draw in this book are actually quite close in terms of uh, history, in terms of events, in terms of human behavior. You know, the way we turn around, we don't notice it. You know, I'm not saying that I notice it all the time. But I am very conscious of my weaknesses. And I do not project myself to be a very strong man. But the general trend, for example, now, I'm not talking of, you know, the good people, really, we all are, you know. We have a problem in terms of actually externalizing this thing and say that, oh, there it is happening. No, it's happening with us. We are it. We are the age and we are moving into a, a rather darkish era. Only thing is that we are not even sure if it is dark. We think it is gray. May I make a comment now? Yes, yes please. Yeah, I'm Mahendra Rathod. Uh, I'm yes. a short story writer. Uh, actually, I'm a misfit here because I stopped reading novels 15 <laughs> years ago. Good, uh, <laughs> Good for uh, you. The question we have for you. Can we have the speaker on screen, please? Uh, Mahendra is my classmate. Yeah. Uh, uh, hi, Mahendra. Hi. Uh, I'm just trying to get your picture. Huh? Okay. So my question to you is from what you have spoken about, uh, there is a lot of intellectual component in the novel that you've written. Uh, how far should a novel engage with questions of uh, intellectual nature uh, is a fundamental question that I would like to ask because we are here not talking of the standard pot boiler novels. We are talking of something where there is a serious engagement with the work. So when you are seriously engaging with the work and if there is so much intellectual content, does the novel then stand as a novel or is it a quasi novel with a lot of philosophy in it? Okay, uh, it's a great question. Uh, you know, the great question actually is, you know, as you very well phrased is, not even the intellectual part of it, it's actually whether literature can engage with ideas, right? That's what it is. And the fact of the matter is it can, whether you're talking about Kafka or Camus, or you know, if you're talking about someone who actually is not very well known, Robert Musil, a man without qualities. He was a contemporary of Thomas Mann. And uh, uh, that book is a very big book, Robert Musil's, uh, you know, uh, Man Without Quality. It's a, it's a, Great book, a terrifying book. And Robert Mosel had a great contempt for Thomas Mann, I must say. But Mann was actually much more successful. Mann's own magic mountain is ideas, right? It's all ideas. Take an engaging writer, highly engaging and popular writer like Hemingway. It is ideas. What's the idea? It is a romantic individualist setting out to kill himself. And he knows he's going to be killed before he even reaches there. And he knows that, right? So we are all talking about ideas, yes. In my novel, which is why I was saying earlier, and I'm sure you know, you know, Mohini would be able to, or Shas would be able to, uh, you know, put in a, a more objective, uh, you know, response to your question. This is not an intellectual novel in that sense at all. It engages you, hopefully, but it's all happening in your lives. It is not, you know, it is not somebody you know, pontificating, it's not that at all. These are, these are, you know, this is what happens in society when society does something, when a minister does something, when a uh, MLA signs a petition, there's a very strong emotional thing happening to it in terms of the people subject to it. You know, when somebody draws a line between the drawing rooms between Pakistan and India, People are dying, right? People are getting separated. Children are getting separated from parents. So it is not an idea. It is happening in your life, right? It's, you are crying for it. You know, you, you, you're wounded, you are dying, right? 
So this is not an intellectual sense in that sense. It is about how these things make characters act and decide. So if those things don't, do not happen, if the characters do not get molded or shaped by these things, then it is a failure. It, it, then the book fails. Then I might as well write an academic dissertation or a, a great pontificatory column in one of the edit pages, which I sometimes do. But the point of the matter is that the thing is that uh, the ideas must actually move you to tears, move you to sufferings, move you to resolutions. You know, you have to go through that, right? And that can happen, which is the reason why I say, you know, some of the problems of Indian literature is that precisely this, they do not know how to really engage with contemporary ideas. I think my, there's another as question. A follow -up, as a follow-up question, uh, when you had the idea to write a novel, uh, did you have all these accumulated uh, intellectual positions in your mind and then you began to write or no, did sir. you begin to write and then these kind of flowed in? No, sir. You know, you, 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 it's a, another very acute question, I must say. I'm saying that it happened in the last six or seven months of a seven-year period of writing. Okay. All right. So, you know, one doesn't approach this thing with ideas. What happens is that one writes and one is getting nowhere with it because one thinks one has done a very good job. But I must, as you know, you are a writer yourself, I must warn you, the word is a very strange thing. You think it is the concrete thing put on a page. It is not. A word is a very fluid thing. It keeps turning with every eye. You know, you look at the page, what somebody is reading into that. For example, if you say, uh, you know, this is about, a, I'll just read three lines. Is What's happening is that, uh, Asip Balakrishnan and his great grandfather is actually sharing a voice. They, they're seeing a kind of a hallucination where inside the room, uh, there this voice is happening. And suddenly the real Asip Mandel stamp or the voice, I'm not showing him because it is not really a dream or anything, right? Says that, you know, I am hungry. He's hungry because he has been starving in Siberia. So he says three lines, another voice, Thin and fraying, familiar as one's own, but issuing from a stranger's throat. Kachoshka, potato. What tuber is more epic? Mr. Menon turns his head in my direction. Poet Golodin, the poet is famished. Do we have anything in the kitchen? Now, the word tuber, potato see how it can be turned around so what you when you and for each person this is going to be a different kind of passage because you know oh what the hell is this guy trying to say you know that's not going to happen but the point is what you have written is not you know unless you are really lucky what is going to be read <laughs> okay that's a risk you take okay i don't want to hug it so uh, uh, everybody else can... No, uh, last question for you, Mahendra. Okay, I have one more question. How did you know? <laughs> uh, you know, CP, uh, one other question I have is, uh, from what you described, <clears throat> you seem to have used uh, various devices of narration to get your complex point across. Uh, therefore, the novel... I have not read it, but it intrinsically requires more engagement because these devices have to be understood. Uh, so now my question to you is this. You are also a poet. Now, poetry is, of course, minimalism. And you are using now very complex devices to interconnect various ideas. So do you feel that uh, that is justified for a novel? Well, in a poetry, what happens is, you know, poetry is not about a thing. This is my understanding of poetry. Poetry is not about a thing. It is actually what it is. Archibald MacLeish is a fine mm. poet, says, you know, a poem is, it is not about something, you know. 
so it is not about a thing a poem is not a poem is a state of feeling it is a feeling is emotion the emotional quotient if you read eliot's essays he will tell you that very clearly much much better than i a novel is about things you know it's a process a poem always shows in relatively the results much faster but in a in, in a narrative like this a, a fiction you have to show the process you know it is like a movie right you know the map has to be shown and the thing is that is not even often the map you have to show the terrain you can't mistake the map for the terrain so the terrain has to be shown yes yeah. Padma ji, I think has got a last question, Sadhvi. Yes, I'm waiting for it. Padma ji, yes. Padma, please come on over. Uh, hi, uh, thank you. I um, I think I've asked the questions in the interview, and you've been so uh, tremendously generous with your response. It connects to the question about ideas, and um, um, one minute, Padma, we can't see your face. Oh, so sorry. Here. Um, <laughs> yeah. Okay. And, uh, Abid, uh, Abid, please ready? allow Padma's picture to be on the screen, please. Goodness. Um. Abid? Uh, oh, let me hang on. I think. Uh, uh, can you uh, see me? Oops. I'm sorry. Guys. Abid, are you there? Sure. Can you? So, um, the, the question or the comment has to do with this conversation about um, the novel does not do ideas. The novel does not. It uh, uh, instead it what it gives us is an experience of human knowledge and or the taste of knowledge or however you want to say it. And I just wanted to um, talk about characterization in the novel and the power of that uh, by just using the example of a minor character. Uh, I think it's the train attendant, Idris is his Idris, name? Yeah. yeah. Idris. And it was just completely, it begins in a really funny way. The first time we introduced to him is uh, Madame Yolanda is um, being announced as dead by her. Is it her son? Is it her? And, and so she's on the train and this train attendant, and we all know what the things we project onto train attendants in India. So, so she is really feeling really warm. He massages her feet, he's close to her. She feels, oh, could, couldn't he be like Idris? And then at the end of it, um, when you know um, he's being taken away by the police, she does not intervene. And then you have all the good people in the novel, uh, whether it's, uh, finally he finds, I think, uh, he's with Arjun, the, the fake guru who, you know, he's selling something. So the way in which everybody treats Idris is, is, is both funny and um, I think you're making a point here about, um, about the way in which our beliefs and our positions and slander, gossip, all of these are mixed up. And no, everybody acts in bad faith towards him. Um, I was wondering if you wanted to speak to that. I thought it was a great example of the way in which you have assiduously tried to avoid sentimentality or there is no sentimentality in the novel. Thank you, uh, Padmaja. Yeah. Uh, see, we are talking about a very cameo character here. It's called Idris uh, Abbottabad. Now, Idris is a guy who's actually, uh, whose father was killed uh, uh, for trading in beef. It is a very short passage, you know, it's not, a, not much at all. But he's a, he's, a, he's a vagrant, he's an itinerant. He keeps moving up and down because he has no home and he's running away from things. And, you know, he doesn't know how to kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, move in society and make a living for, him, so, living for himself. So it's very hard for him. Now, that is an idea, right? Idris Abbottabad. And Abbottabad is very specifically given because of the you know, Bin Laden uh, Association. Because he's not responsible for that. His family comes from that area. I and mean, he's not responsible for being uh, associated with Abbottabad, but that's his name. Now, the, and, you know, and he, I don't think he occupies more than about three pages in a 372-page no novel, right? But that is an idea. What is the idea? The idea is that, you know, um, Sir was talking about the idea, uh, how can we 
put that in, into a novel or a, into fiction. It's an idea because it is about a certain person. I, I won't even talk about the religious part of it. I would say a man on the run all the time. You know, it is about identities in fluid, uh, uh, you know, state all the time. You know, you and we ourselves are fluid. You know, we are moving one all the time. We are becoming something else. So these are not really ideas being explicated in, in, in paragraphs after paragraphs. In fact, the book has very few descriptive passages. It moves in dialogues. You know, the action moves forward in dialogues. So what I'm saying is that the character can be an idea without actually trying to uh, sort of making himself or herself into a a boring uh, one-dimensional figure. Uh, anyone else? Uh, there was someone called uh, Suds the Galaxy. She wanted to say something, or he wanted to say. Is it there? Is it there? Someone there? Okay, my question you're not Sir, answering. Uh, One minute. Go ahead. I am Sudeshna Kundu. Uh, uh, basically, Hi, uh, now. Yeah, hi. But I have written something that I totally agree with the ideology of Mr. Uh, CP. Uh, so I just written only. I don't have any question. Uh, okay. okay. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank okay. You. Can, I Can I make yes. a little comment? Can I make a little comment? Yes. Uh, yeah, it's it's very good and authentic because this is a. Uh, um, uh, uh, modern times are uh, changing and uh, we don't know whether we are uh, going to the dark phase or a light phase. Uh, we are a bit confused. That's true. Uh, uh, that is the, he is telling uh, within this novel, actually. This yes. is my opinion. Thank you. Thank you, Sudeshna. So, Sudeshna, uh, so, you are asking mm -hmm. the same question that I had asked uh, uh, CP some time back. Of course, he has not replied. But uh, mm -hmm. CP, I, what I talked about was that the foreboding that I feel that well, the world we know is ending, it scares me because I can't see the light at the end of the tunnel at all. Uh, so you said that, yes, you're right, but I wanted you to go and talk about it. Uh, uh, see, I, you know, I think the- You see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I no longer care uh, because the thing <laughs> is that, you know, I, I don't, care anymore because you know it is the it, it, i've come to a point where i actually believe that the passage or the or the negotiation of the tunnel itself is what the light is all about okay. so so when you are writing something you know all i can say is that you know do not try to please people with the writing please the writing itself so in there for a short moment or for a short while uh, you know, tomorrow I don't, you know, I could actually, there are so many people popping off left, right, and center. It's like Jeffrey Bernard said, there's a party out there. The point is, we can't really uh, expect in the long run, there is no long run. In the long run, we are all dead, right? In the, in, the, in, in the short run, all we can do is to, you know, you know, just make a mark in terms of, uh, if possible, don't have to be panicky about it. Every breath, which is the word, you know, right? You know, you are, in fact, the last passage actually talks about that, you know, the, of this novel. So it is the, you know, what you write, the words which you're talking about, the words you write are units of your finite breaths. There's only so many breaths you can take, right? So, so I, I, I no longer think in terms of uh, the end of Morals. the tunnel. I don't think so. Uh, I think somebody wants to ask. Prasen I, th I think Prasenjit wants to say something. And after that, I think uh, Bina is waiting. Oh, great. Prasenjit, you're on. Switch, switch, switch your audio. OK. Uh, do, you, uh, do you listen to me now? Very well. OK. My, uh, my question is that I would like to tell Sipi on that. You know, I found the novel is a curious play on memory and amnesia, you know? So I find what role does memory play, you know, individual memory, collective memory, memory of loss, disposition, uh, Osip uh, remembering a lot of things and Osip the grandfather is forgetting uh, or, or, or he seems to forget the horrid past that 
he subscribes to. Right. And I find that Osip is also at the, at the end of the novel, Osip uh, dreaming so many things, such a, such a blue eyed lover is just uh, stuck into a conformity. Uh, so it is kind of a death of a soul actually, which is worse than the death of the body. So somehow I feel throughout the whole novel, I find that there is an interplay of memory and forgetfulness. And uh, we all know Milan Kundera's famous quote about on the, on the, that, the struggle of power, and et cetera, et cetera. So I'd like to very much uh, to hear CP on that, how, how, how uh, he wants, how he, cause, I, I mean, he consciously whether he wanted to uh, play memory a part or not, or it just came, came along. Thank so you very thank much. You, thank you, Prasenjit. Thank you so thank much you. for your time. Okay. Uh, uh, first of all, Bina will come and then, uh, and no, no, then uh, Padma no, no. will come back uh, and ask we, something. Yeah, we have to answer this question, uh, Satish. Yeah, please. Please answer that. Okay. So the thing is, uh, one of the epic, there are two epigraphs in the novel, right? The, the beginning, right? The first one is uh, Osip Mandelstam talking about how his father, Jewish father, took him to another century, another world. The second one is uh, Garcia, uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez's quote that it is not what happens, it is how you remember it, yeah. right? So, you know, yeah. and, you know, Proust has made a whole, you know, unreadable world out of, uh, you know, as it were, uh, memory. And me you know, memory is a thing. Memory is what you selectively choose to adorn your sense of self. Now, that sense of self can be one of heroic victories, you know, how you survived terrible situations, which is good. It could be easily how you are a victim all the time, you know, how he or she did this to me. Remember that? Remember that day? Now, the thing is, memory itself is a kind of, you know, you know a, a chiaroscuro of things. It keeps playing up and down and you know, back and forth, you don't know. Why is it that uh, a man who is, uh, you know, uh, suffering, apparently this great grandfather who is suffering, suffering from dementia or Alzheimer's, and I know a little about Alzheimer's because my father who was a writer and the Sahitya Academy secretary who wrote about 40 books in Malayalam, he's one of the founders of criticisms and journalism there. Uh, he died of Alzheimer's, uh, uh, you know, for 10 years or so. Some of that, of course, actually, appears in this novel as well. Now, what happens there as well as here is that, you know, in the novel as also is that uh, memory is what you do with your time. You know, you, you know you, you, uh, what is time actually? Time is what you carve uh, you out of. You know, you, that's the material out from which you carve yourself, you know, into something, as something which can be negotiated in your sleep in your nightmares, in your waking hours, with your people, with your children, with your friends and lovers, with yourself, right? That is what memory is. And it is not an easy thing at all. So we, we are actually talking here about how memories altered, not just in your mind. If you check Google or if you check Wikipedia, <coughs> memory is what you choose to put in there or in terms of algorithms right you know so uh, 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 the mob of algorithm you know the 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 data driven thing and more people reading something some you know a good thing about you a bad thing about you that is your memory now you you have no control over it which is what for to a great extent one of the characters in this novel arjun bedi suffers from you know he can't escape you know the invasion of his private self, by, uh, by Google, by Wikipedia, he can't do a damn thing about it, right? So memory is no longer yours. You have been disowned by memory. Memory is now a technical thing. You know, you can't control it anymore. See, it's a very complex thing you know, to shut your eyes and ears to that and continue with a very uh, a, a monolinear, uh, you know, uh, monochromatic uh, life. I think it is uh, good for survival, but I don't think it is a great thing for your, uh, you know, life. life. Thank oh, you. I think uh, Bina wants to say something, and then the Padma will, uh, will come back in again. Bina, thank you. 
Thank you. So, um, from CP, CP um, I, I've loved your book. I think I've actually Thanks. gone on to review it. Thank you. So and um, I, I've come across many great reviews of the book, uh, but I, I did come across one criticism that uh, this book is propaganda. It's got uh -huh. a personal agenda, and that's what you're trying to get out. Mm -hmm. And I've, I've been curious to know what your uh, answer or response to that would be. Uh, a personal agenda is uh, uh, maybe you are right. I don't know. You know, how does one remove one's person from one's writing? You can't, right? You are actually there, right? You're, you're, the writing is your person, right? I keep saying to people, in fact, I think last month I gave an interview where somebody asked me the question is it history or is it fiction? You know, and the fact of the matter is that. Uh, a novel, fiction is actually a history of a, a small collective, right? Um, so the personal agenda is actually not to have a personal agenda. For example, there are characters in this novel who may, in fact, you know, almost all the seven or eight characters, including the one of the characters, a cameo, but a very powerful character as a news baron, Alok Jain. Uh, Arjun Bedi, the, the iconoclast writer, for example, or Osip Mandelstam himself, Elizabeth, Arun Dudani, who is a CEO of the news company of Alok Jain, uh, Anand, who is a, the, the guru, fake guru classmate of uh, uh, Anand, uh, sorry, uh, of uh, Osip. All these people are actually part of one's life. You know, it is not as if one has done this thing completely out of one's imagination. Why, why do I say that? I say it because uh, there is no imagination. There is only the truth. Truth in terms of what happens, right? Which is the reason why some, I think Marquis talks about, you know, uh, is not what happens, is how you remember it. The remembrance of thing is where manipulations come. I am trying to expose those manipulations in terms of subjectivity and emotional uh, underlaying of characters. So the personal agenda is the only personal agenda I would think there is to say it is not what you would like to think. There's more to it, that's all. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Padma. Padma, you're next, once again. Um, oh, thank you. Um, I, I just wanted to say, I think the power of this novel for me and um, the, the, the power of this novel is precisely this truthfulness, um, uh, the truthfulness or what you called uh, the fictionality of the fictionality of truth in literature. And I think less and less we have we somehow want the writer to, to enlist the writer as a guru or a friend instead of reading the book. <laughs> and I, I, I think that this, this novel is, was a tremendous experience um, because it, it, it gives us that taste of knowledge and experience. Uh, I think the characters, especially Gloria, Chris for me, uh, they made me weep. Um, and I read several very clever, uh, there is no cleverness in this novel. And that's another thing I'd like to speak, you know, for, that's, I speak to the power of this novel, the truthfulness in that. So is there, there is nothing, um, there's no justification. There is, it, it just is, in that sense, it seemed to me like uh, a novel that I, I could read. Uh, I, I could read without, you know, getting my armor up in a way, you know, so. Thank you, Padma. So, um, yes, do, uh, do read the novel, you will enjoy it. TB, you asked to respond? No, I think, uh, you know, that's what I was trying to do. I'm very glad, uh, you know, Padma, uh, uh, you know, uh, understands the intentions of the novel well, because, I, you know, I'm sure you must have uh, heard of a poet called Paul Seelan, a great poet, one of the greatest poets. And uh, 
you know, uh, he, I mean, he lost his country, he lost his village, he lost his parents, he lost his language, he lost his lovers, he lost his son, he lost himself, and of course, he died in the same, uh, committing suicide, I think 1973 or something. Paul Seelan's uh, poetry, if you haven't read, you must read. It's, 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 like, it's like, a, like a hammer, and it's very tight and, you know, almost... Uh, almost seemingly disconnected the words. Paul Seelan said that, you know, to ha get a good reader is to shake hands with him across centuries. So a good reader is somebody who actually understands the intentions of the author. I mean, there are lots of criticisms about me as well, not only in literature, but writing as well, I mean, real life as well. And it is easy to dismiss a thing. But why is it so easy? It's easy to dismiss a thing. I have been a reviewer myself, so I know what I'm talking about. Because you are reading yourself into it. You are not reading the novel. You are reading what must have been your novel. <laughs> you see? So that, that, that's a great thing. Real, you know, that is also an indication. Because in the last 10 or 12 reviews on, on the book, I can see everybody's talking about different things, not the same thing. That is a, probably a good thing, I, I suppose, I hope. So, uh, uh, so I'm very glad that it is being understood at, you know, by uh, a few readers. I don't know where it's going to go because you know, I'm sure that you know, uh, somebody <laughs> would trash it and I'm sure somebody has trashed it. Somebody has actually said that the whole thing is in a hallucination, which is not at all true. It is not an hallucination, it's actually happening, <laughs> all right, <laughs> you know? It's a, and, uh, you know, you know, your rush, your need, and I, I am telling you from my experience, it's not as if I have been very, uh, you know, uh, innocent of that. Your need to judge whether a man, woman, or a book is so overpowering because that's the only way you're going to feel okay with yourself, with some urge to, you know, be, uh, you know, you know, to live with yourself, you got to do damn a whole bunch of things. And I think I understand that to a great level, <laughs> I guess. Okay. Uh, uh, more um, anything else? Would you like to? Uh, no, I mean, if, uh, if everyone has asked their question. Uh, can I just ask one? Okay, yes. Uh, this is a short one. Ms. Latika. Who is this? Latika. Latika, yeah. Okay, hi, Latika. Reason... Hi. Uh, you yourself have used the word hallucination. Yes. When you were talking earlier, you used this word. And it struck me um, because then afterwards you spoke of truth. Hmm. Now, where does hallucination stand vis-a-vis -vis truth? And okay. then it occurs to me that is Asip Mendelstam also hallucinated because he went quietly towards madness, you know, for a while. Yeah. So there were hallucinations in his life too. I wonder if that ever made any difference to your writing or conception of your character. Uh, but well, where do hallucinations stand vis-a-vis -vis truth? Uh, Latika, uh, another very acute question because the idea or the, or the reality of hallucination is very strange. It's very hallucinatory. <laughs> uh, you know, I find, and this I've mentioned once before uh, in another interview, but I can't get out away from that. You know, we hallucinate normality, right? You know, we move from bedroom to kitchen or to drawing room. Look at that passage. We get up from our chair, give away, I mean, stop doing whatever we have done with the computer or what, book or whatever, you know, something else, movies, whatever nonsense it is. And then we move on, right? Take the vestibule, the hallway and go into the drawing room and move into the kitchen. Look at that. Look at what, what all you have done in that brief five seconds. You have lived a whole lifetime, not only your lifetime, perhaps if you have, for example, your late fathers or your, your lovers or you know, husbands or you know, photograph on the desk which you left, you have left a whole lifetime there. And you're moving into the kitchen and lifting a spoon and putting it into some water or boil, lighting a gas or whatever it is. That entire thing is unreal. Why is it unreal? Because you're not going to ever repeat it ever. You see, that is a whole point. You know, the, the, 
the entropy of it, of each and every gesture, of each and every thought, that is what makes it unreal. Now there is, you know, in, there's this, uh, of course you all heard of him, the great writer, Borges. So there's this short story by him, it's like five pages, it's like a whole fiction. I think it's called Funus Memorius. I don't know how to pronounce it properly. The name of this boy, this young man is Funus. And he's Borges. Really, yeah, uh, Funus Memorius. Borges is, Borges is one, yeah. he's a writer, but the name of the short story is Funus Memorius. He's a ill boy, ill, Ill, young, Ill young man. And the story is, he cannot forget anything. He can remember, if you say last Wednesday evening's cloud formations, he can, he, can, he can tell you the cloud formations. So he cannot get out of it. He remembers everything, right? What I am also trying mm. to say is that that, rem that act, Although Boris's novel is uh, short story is great, it's a one hell of a short story. He dies young because he can't really survive that kind of a uh, the, the 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 character. It's a hell of a character because he can't survive that kind of exposure to memory because he remembers everything. We can't. We we, we it's like you know going out into the outer space and being subject to solar radiation. We can't take memory, which is the reason why. T.S. Eliot in Squatters says, the human mind cannot take too much reality. You understand? So the, the fluidity which we are talking about in this novel is not really idea driven. The fluidity is actually emotion driven. I hope I've been able to answer partly the question that you got. Thank raised. you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Moini, I think you can you take over. Before that, I think Farooq wants to say something. No, no, yes, absolutely. I want to ask something. Who, who's that? Indu, uh, Indu, Indu please wants go ahead. to ask something. Indu, we can't hear you too well. Come closer to the Mr. mic. Mr. CP, when you speak of this fluidity, I'm thinking of stream of consciousness technique. Stream of consciousness of James Joyce, of Virginia Woolf, and you know the whole association memory that life is not just that reality and physical reality, but in our minds they are forever moving the way you are telling us. And what we have looked at James Joyce in Portrait of the Artist as a Young Man, in which he sees that stalk on the beach and he thinks of a stalk, it's actually a beautiful woman who is draped in white. And that's when, at that moment, he decides that he's going to become an artist. And that moment is like an epiphanic revelation for him. Something like that. And when you move in reality, you're actually in your mind somewhere. Oh, and yeah. Thank you, Indu, madam. I think how, that is exactly the point. Yeah. That, that's right. You know, yeah. when we are moving in reality, you are moving in mind. That is so well put. That's what it is. I, of course, I am not, yeah. you know, I am not actually adapted or adopted uh, a stream of consciousness technique here because I think that is done with. And it is also a bit easy now, you know, to say that is stream of consciousness or magical realism. <laughs> or, it's too easy. What we are doing here is to uh, Thank you. make it in, uh, you know, a, 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 in a different kind of structure, how to make the stream of consciousness uh, are more accessible. For example, you know, Ulysses is not a very easy novel, neither is Finnegan's Wake. The, the, mm. Dallas, uh, the artist novel is a great, uh, the portrait of the artist is a young man. That's a very readable novel. But that is his first novel, right? But before he moves into something else. But here it is not stream of consciousness. You know, it is actually that, you know, we are saying what we are doing, you know, the, in the afternoons when you sleep, for example, the sleep is not stream of consciousness. That is what it is. You know, you're moving through mind, through reality, moving in reality through mind. It is a very, uh, you know, it's a very, it's a great phrase that you have just now used. That's what I'm trying to do that, you know, we look at things not as, as things are, but as things appear to us to be. 
and the way they want us to. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, Moini, take over. Okay, so um, thank you, uh, CP. Thank you so much for being with us today. I think I can truly say this has been very rewarding, very rewarding discussion. We've talked of important things. You've helped us to uh, helped us to prepare ourselves for reading the novel. Those of us who haven't, because you've told us important aspects of it, which will be guideposts, you know, when we read. And also, thank you everybody who participated, who made comments, who asked questions. Thank you so much. This has been a lovely session. Farooq, the last thank word. Thank you so much. Thank uh, you all the participants as well. Tipi, uh, Farooq Merchant is the founder of Gyan Adar. So I'm handing over to him for the last word. So first of all, I would like to thank CP for a wonderful session, very thought provoking session. And uh, we, we wish to have you back in the book club in the future. Thank you. Uh, yeah. And uh, from behalf, uh, I think uh, uh, Mohini will be telling you about all the other book club programs that are going to take place next Sunday and the future Sundays. Right. But under Gyan Adab, we also do programs under Guldasta Urdu, and uh, we have the special programs on this. And one of the programs that we are having on September 4th is the program on, uh, as I told you last time, that, uh, uh, um, uh, can you see the screens? Yes. Yeah. I so can. this is the program which is going to be uh, 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 Indian classical music by Neeraja Aptikar from uh, Vancouver. She's going to sing from Vancouver. Oh, and uh, hosting the program will be Sandeep Prakash Bide. And uh, this will be on September 4th at 7 o'clock in the evening. So just imagine that they, they will be getting up in the morning at 7.30 to host this program. And this is only because they want to collect money for Nityasha Foundation. Nityasha okay. Foundation, which uh, I told you in my previous thing, uh, previous, uh, this is an NGO which works for children with type 1 diabetes and... Uh, uh, we collect money during the programs that we we see today, and uh, 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 where is that? Um, one minute, give me a minute. Okay, where, where is that presentation mode? I hear it. Which day is this again? Uh, this is on fourth of September. Okay, let's hope. And uh, so Nityasha is the program that uh, is the program that we collect, and this is the Google uh, <coughs> QR code where we collect the donation and uh, we'll be sending this to you from our creatives. All our creatives have the Nityasha Foundation uh, link in it. Okay. And this is a program that we cut with type 1 diabetes. These are children who don't produce insulin. And Nityasha Foundation collects money and gives it to uh, these children in form of medical aid. Okay. Uh, on the 11th, on the 14th of September, we normally have the Hindi Divas. With, uh, the whole month is a Hindi month, but 14th is the date. But we are going to conduct a program on the 11th of September to celebrate Hindi Divas. And on that day, we will be hosting one author, uh, just like as we have today. The author's name is Meera Kant. She has written a lot of uh, uh, novels. She has written a lot of uh, plays in Hindi. And she also does a lot of translation of other people's writing in Urdu, uh, rather in Hindi. And uh, she writes Urdu Hindi also. She's from Kashmir. So she knows a lot of Urdu. So we'll be speaking to this author on 11th of uh, September, celebrating Hindi Divas. And okay. uh, yeah, and I just want to inform you before I uh, hand it over to Moini is that all our programs, including this book club, come on the Facebook also. So as soon as we finish, Abid, who is the gentleman behind the scene who's operating the Zoom, We'll be putting the link on the book club and I'll be putting it on all the uh, chat boxes, all the broadcast lists so that you get it. Uh, immediately on Monday morning, my secretary, Tushar Shingare, chops off all the unnecessary things, edits it and puts it back on the Facebook. And then it comes on the our gyanadab.org archives page on the website. So all our programs are there on the archives page. Okay. So if you have missed today's program, you can see it on that. If you want to forward the link to anybody by tomorrow evening, it will be there on the website. The links will be there. Facebook link will be there. And Or if you just go to Facebook, type Gyanadab and the name of the book if possible, Done. you'll get it. Okay. So, I think Subodh, Subodh wants to ask a question. Yeah, Subodh wants to ask a question. Ask me a question? No, no. Ask a question. Subodh? 
But look, are you finished? Are you... Yeah, so I am finished. Only thing is that uh, if Subodh wants to ask a question to whom? He well, you know, you, uh, hello, uh, hello, yes, CP. Uh, you know, yeah, yeah. Thank you for the opportunity. First of all, CP, uh, happy onam to you. And uh, uh, I just wanted to know whether uh, you know your work will be translated into other languages, especially Malayalam. CP, that is a question to you. I don't think CP has heard it clearly. Wait, it's CP. CP, no, CP is gone off. CP is oh. gone off now. Okay. Oh, okay. Oh. Yeah. So, um, so sorry, Subodh, you will not get the answer. That's, I will talk, I will that's, talk that's not a that. problem. That's not a problem. And uh, you know, I would like to be included in this forum. And I could, I, you know, I, I request Mr. Farooq. Can you and put on your chat box your phone number or your email ID? Yeah, I will do that. Will. Please, please put the put it down okay. immediately. Yes, please do that. And uh, of course, Nityasha is the NGO that Satish is also giving the royalties from his book to. Yeah, I, I really appreciate that. Yeah, it's it's doing very good work, and we appreciate that. Now, next Sunday, we are going to be having Sanjay Bharke talk about a book called "The Beginning of Infinity" by David Deutsch. Okay, so very interesting indeed. And on the 5th of September, the Sunday after that, we're likely to have Nandini Sen talking about Midnight's Children. So I will put the calendar up very soon. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. See you, you. See you bye, Saturday bye. and Sunday. Thank bye. you, Subodh. Bye. All the best, CP. Bye, man. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much, CP. Okay.